Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Harris. With me, of course, is Mike Tagliere. Find us on Twitter at DanHarris80 and at Mike Tagliere NFL. Tags, how are you? I'm good. I'm better this week than I was last week. And let me say why. My son, his birthday was on Monday. He turned four years old. We moved from a stage, you know, you have the terrible twos, then you have the treacherous threes, which, by the way, I always thought it was just twos, and then like oh, apparently no. I got older and threes are just no. bad. Uh, no. But he, now he's four, so we were like, we're going to move on to fantastic four. So we're maintaining a positive attitude, and he's been really good this week. So I, I happy birthday, buddy, and uh, and thanks for being you know better than you were three. Does he listen to this podcast? Because if not, you're just talking to nobody. He I listens mean, he to had... it. He may not know it, but he listens to it. Well, I for me, this week uh, has been great because we try to do family walks with the dog as much as we can just to make sure the kids are getting exercise. Mm-hmm. And my son will only go if I quiz him on penalties for the NFL. So it's I spend legitimately an hour every day walking and he needs to he's trying to memorize all the symbols for the penalties. Like, mm-hmm. all right, what what does the rep do when it's 12 men on the field or something and how many yards it is? And it's it's really enjoyable. He's like a little savant. Maybe he'll grow up to be a referee, which is better because I don't really want him to play <laughs> football, you know, because he's like tiny and, you know, whatever. But anyway, that's what I've been doing. So nice. if you ever want to know what, you know, the symbol is for delay of game, Will's got you covered, man. It's amazing. <laughs> it's been the best. Anyway, we have actual football to discuss. It's championship weekend. We're going to be breaking it down from a DFS perspective. And luckily, we have a great guest. It's the chief operating officer over at FadeTheNoise.com, Elliot Christ. You can find him on Twitter at his name, Elliot Christ. Elliot, thanks for popping on. How you doing? I'm doing well. I, uh, I'm kind of jealous of those walks. If you guys ever need another person to kind of come along and, and try do the penalty stuff, I'm, I'm down. That sounds amazing. I mean, you have to. It, it's got to be structured, though, Elliot. You know, you got to like build from like the you know, like a five yard penalty to the 15. The one he loves the most is the touchback because he got really excited when Higgins fumbled the ball out of the end zone this weekend and he like explaining to him that rule, right? He'd be like, oh, do they get it at the one? And I was like, oh no, but it's, it's turnover now. They, he's like, so do they get it at the 20? I'm like, well, actually the Chiefs get it, you know, at 25, they, they get a touchback from them. And he's pretty livid about that, but he does like sort of that it looks like, you know, you're waving your arms, like you're a bird or something like that. So you got to build up to it. If you're ready to do that, I will gladly invite you on the walks. Are you good with that? I mean, that sounds phenomenal. I'm, I'm all in. We used to play, um, where did that guy go to college or uh, in in school? I turned it into a little uh, bit of a drinking game, and we were, were all sober because by a month into it, we knew where every single player in the NFL went, went to college because we had so much yeah. fun with it. So this seems like the better adult version of that game. So I might I might try that with Will, but he'll be <laughs> drinking chocolate milk instead of alcohol for at least for now. Chocolate milk only for that little man. All right, anyway, guys. So you know how we usually do it. We do the the. You know, the pricier cash game option, the safer cash game, the value cash game option, the GP. But it's two games. We can't really do that on the slate. So we're just going to basically go through both games. We'll break down the primary players. We'll do it mostly from a cash game perspective. And then we'll talk about GPPs later, unless you guys want to throw in that you feel that any particular player is more of a GPP play as we're going through it. But that's basically what we'll do. We'll go game by game, and then we'll talk about each position and each relevant player. Uh, and so in addition, though, to talking about Everybody from a DFS perspective, in a few hours, I'm going to be recording the Betting Pros NFL podcast and talking about everybody from a betting perspective. You can find that anywhere that you download podcasts or at bettingpros.com slash podcast. Uh, Matt Peralt is always there with me. He's the host of the Daily Juice podcast, joins me every week. We make our best bets. We break down every single game. Again, that's Betting Pros NFL podcast. Get it anywhere you listen to podcasts or at bettingpros.com slash podcast. All right, guys, let's start with the first game, and that's the Bucks visiting the Packers. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure really what the best way to do this is, whether or not. Well, let's start with the running back position, of course. So I guess I can throw it to you. Elliot, we'll just start here instead of me naming specific players. From the running back position, who are you most likely to play in cash games at this point from the Bucks against the Packers? It's such an interesting slate, right? Because you can make an argument that four, the four best quarterbacks this year are playing in this game. Now, I would make a case that Watson isn't, but obviously his team's 4-12, and 12, right? But Brady's been phenomenal. Rodgers, MVP of the league. Mahomes and Allen, we know about their success. And that comes with explosive passing games. It also came along with the fact that the running backs in this game are have are not exciting at all. And Aaron Jones is the top payup option going up against the best run defense in the NFL, splitting time. Um, that's not really exciting. At the same point, the Bucks allow the most receptions to running backs this season. So 
you could you could make an argument there. We still don't know the status of Clyde edwards alaire uh, If he's out, I think Daryl Williams is a cash game lock for me. Um, Leonard Fournette could catch a lot of passes. The running back position, I'm really looking to save money because I want to pay up for wide receiver studs. So for, in cash, like uh, for me, it's I mean Devin Singletary is another decent option too because he played all the snaps, right? Which provides a nice little floor. But at the same time, the Bills don't run the ball. But if you want to attack the Chiefs, you want to attack the Chiefs underneath um, with running backs and tight ends and slot receivers. So, it's honestly, the running back slate, this might be the messiest running back slate of the entire year. Um, but I think Clyde edwards Lair or Daryl Williams, depending on who's going to be healthy, is definitely going to be one of them for me. All right. So first of all, we're going just both. We're going everybody here that we're going for both games. is totally fine. So, but let me ask you something. If Edwards Alaire, because I guess he did return to practice. So I, it's, it's trending positive necessarily for him. If he does play though, do you expect him? Or like, would you be willing to throw him out there in cash games necessarily? Or would you be worried that Williams is probably going to eat into his role even more than uh, Le'Veon Bell was before that? So for me, a big thing is, um, you know, it's Thursday morning when we record this, right? So there's still sure. a lot of injury information to come out. If it says that he's going to get his normal workload at 5K, it's going to be really tough for me to avoid that. You want to, you can attack the Bills on the ground. They allow explosive running plays. He's involved in the passing game. Um, you know, I think that he'll play 60% of the snaps and at 5K in the Chiefs offense. That's That's enough for me to feel comfortable. Would you feel better or worse about Edwards Alaire or Williams if Edwards Alaire misses the game, depending on whether or not Patrick Mahomes plays? Now, I think we're all expecting him to play at this point, but if he's out, does that make the running backs more attractive or less attractive to you? It makes them less attractive because the Chiefs are now going to, the game script's going to flip, right? They'll be underdogs. Uh, they might want to run more, but the offense has a lot less scoring potential, which means there's a lot less touchdown equity. So, I would I would really lose a lot of interest in them altogether. All right, Tags, let me throw it to you here. Let's start with the Chiefs guys. So let's just break them down mm-hmm. both from a cash game perspective, and then we can touch on some of the other guys. Edward Delaire is 5,000. Daryl Williams is 4,800 on DraftKings. So how do you feel about both those guys? I mean, obviously, depending on who plays, from a cash game perspective. If Daryl Williams were – if Clyde Edward Delaire did not play and Daryl Williams did play, then Williams is a smash play. He's like a guy that you lock into your lineup and you forget him. Uh, if Edward Delaire plays, I am worried about it. I'm, I'm worried about the fact that they split touches and that they're there's not enough to go around because this team generally didn't run the ball a whole lot during the regular season. That's why when Le'Veon Bell came there, Clyde edwards helaire just kind of basically fell off a cliff and you couldn't really start him with any confidence. But if you go back to the matchup in week six, and I don't know if this is just, you know, it's a one game sample size, but when these two teams played back in week six, the Chiefs ran the ball 35 times with their running backs and it worked. Uh, they ran for 204 yards and a touchdown. So it's it's definitely a backfield that has intrigue. And it's like Elliot said, this is an ugly slate. I, it's almost to the point where I was putting together this cash game article that I'm doing. And like, I want to play Aaron Jones because he's the only guy with a guaranteed workload that I see in this game or in this, because like you, you could run through every single running back and say, Aaron Jones is the only one who I know for certain is going to get 18 touches in this game. You can't say that about the Chiefs running backs. You can't say that about Leonard, Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones because Ronald Jones is getting healthier. You cannot say that about Devin Singletary, who just got 10 touches in a game that they won. I, I, you can't say it about anybody. So it's like trying to figure out which ones you want to use. It's it's almost to the point, Dan, where you just basically build your roster how you want and whatever running backs fit in your it, – it's weird to say this because usually we're looking for which running backs to pay up for. I don't really think there is one this week. I think Devin Singletary's fine at 4,500. You have to hope that he's going to get more than those 10 touches that he got last week because the Chiefs are a team that you can beat with running backs. But the Buffs, the Bills have known, shown no confidence in Devin Singletary at all, even with Zach Moss out of the lineup. Uh, so you're kind of rooting for Clyde Edwards-Hilaire to, to miss this game just because you want to play Daryl Williams. But right. at the same time, everyone would. Uh, so if Edwards-Hilaire plays – it's going to become a much different slate, right? Because not everybody's going to play Daryl Williams. I think he's more of a tournament option. I guess Edwards Alaire would be the one that I would want to play from that backfield if I had to choose one. Uh, but it's it's ugly, man. So I think as of right now, I'm leaning towards Aaron Jones, Devin Singletary, and in the flex, I'm probably going to go with a wide receiver or tight end. Yeah, it's really tough with Singletary, right? Because of, you know, last week, you know, they 
they didn't I don't I forget how many rushing attempts they had in the first half was it one I, I don't even remember yeah. whatever carries they it, gave it, him. Was, it was one just, it was one rushing play in the first half yeah. I think yeah yeah just ridiculous right yep. so I mean he was out there for basically every snap so you do have that so there of course is some upside especially against the Chiefs which tags we've talked about so many times this year and I poo-pooed it a little bit towards the end of the season sort of talking about their competition but they are very very good against wide receivers and so we'll see what the Bills are going to be able to do with that so you think this is a spot for Singletary so let me ask you guys this because neither one of you is really touching on the Bucks running game and I'm going to assume that that is because we don't really know exactly what's going to be going on there because you know with Green Bay, like that's kind of where you attack them to the extent you attack their defense. You do it on the ground. Fournette uh, is, you know, he got much more of the work than Jones. Jones looked fine, but he looked gimpy last week. Like he didn't look 100% and Fournette is running most of the routes. And so I I don't know if you guys are just kind of discounting that uh, given that we think Jones is just probably getting healthier. He is fairly expensive, but Elliot, break down how you feel about both Bucks running backs, assuming, you know, we're not really going to know exactly what the breakdown is going in, but you don't think either one is really a great cash game play. Yeah, I mean, this, I think Tags kind of broke it down perfectly where he said, you want to build the rest of your roster and come back to running backs. And Aaron Jones is the obvious guy at 6,500, but A.J. Dillon, if he, you know, he's questionable right now, but him and Jamal Williams ate into, eats into his upside a little bit. Vita Vea could come back and the Bucks have the number one run defense. So there's no real safe running back. Which is why I would rather pay up a receiver and figure out the rest. Um, Ronald Jones did, you know, touch the ball 13 times last week. He had that explosive run. It's a much easier matchup. Uh, he pulled up lane, but you know, he also came back in the game and, and was involved. So, I'm, I would probably prefer Ronald Jones at 4600, but Fournette's going to get the pass game usage. Like, it's it's a tough, it's a really tough two game slates in general are very tough to play cash uh, because of the. <laughs> the lack of options, the lack of security in both of these ground games. I mean, um, so I think Ronald Jones is too cheap at 4,600. Devin Singletary is guaranteed the workload. Um, I would, I think it really is a true coin flip because Fournette will at least get a couple targets in this game. He's got 10 this, this playoffs, but his workload could also continue to reduce. I think Ronald Jones is probably the safer play at 4,600. Yeah, Tags, what do you think? I mean, there is a $700 difference between them, Fournette at 5,300 on DraftKings, Jones at 4,600. And again, Fournette did run, you know, the the majority of the routes, you know, last week. And again, I don't know if that is just, you know, Jones coming back and sort of them easing him in and, and, uh, you know, necessarily sort of he left that game, as as Elliot mentioned, very briefly and then came back in and still looked okay. So what do you think if you're, if you have to look at those two, which you have to, because I'm forcing you to, to look at those two for cash games, what are you thinking about for them? I guess it depends on what we hear about Ronald Jones as the week goes deeper. Like if he gets in a full practice, I'd be, I'd be more inclined to use him because I do believe that he's the better running back. Leonard Fournette, he's been, he's fine, whatever. Like I, it's almost like I had one of those, baby, I was wrong moments. Um, <laughs> You know, this year where I said Leonard Fournette just looks like crap. I don't, I don't know how else to say it in a nice way, but he does not look like the running back that I thought he was going to be coming out of LSU. He's, he's just a guy, basically. Uh, he doesn't have the long, the top end speed. There was a run last week where I saw him hit the edge, and it was like the Leonard Fournette we saw at LSU would have been gone. It would have been like an 80 yard touchdown run, but he's getting caught by ankle tackles. Like he's just not, I don't know. He's just not very good. Uh, so I would prefer to play Ronald Jones, but I. Honestly, the reason I didn't bring these guys up when I said about cash is because I just feel like there's too much instability. We've we've seen it with Bruce Arians time and time again where it's like, oh, we think we could trust this running back, and then you, you really can't. But if, if for whatever reason Ronald Jones is limited all the way th- throughout the entire week, and then we get Sunday and it's like he's still going to be a little bit limited, then I'd probably say Fournette, but I, mm-hmm. I don't want to play either of them. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Running back is really not where we love <laughs> to look this week. It, it's really not. Um, There are certainly other positions where we can find a little more value, and we're going to get to that. We're going to get to wide receiver. But before we do, I will let you guys know that the most difficult thing that I do in my life is to try to get my kids to try new food. I know I'm not alone. I know that's how it works when you have young kids, uh, but especially Will, who I mentioned earlier, loves penalties, all of that good stuff. Uh, You know I talk about him often. He is particularly stubborn, which you know if you have listened to this podcast before. And it's not like I ask him to try these obscure vegetables that nobody's ever heard of, like try a piece of bacon, have a cheeseburger, stuff that I know that he's going to like. My new strategy, though, works pretty well, and that is to tell him that a famous athlete that he knows eats that same food before (laughs) every game. So, like, the kid barely eats cereal. I love Magic Spoon cereal. So one morning during breakfast, I said, you know who loves this cereal, man? Patrick Mahomes. 
eats it before every game and we were in. But that's just the fruity flavor. A.J. Brown eats the frosted flavor. Tom Brady, the blueberry. And then Jacob DeGrom eats cocoa because we're big Mets fans. Uh, All four flavors have been officially approved by the picky seven-year-old and his rapidly aging mother and father because it's healthy. There's no sugar, 11 grams of protein, only three net grams of carbs in each serving. It is GMO-free. It is gluten-free. It is soy-free. It is keto-friendly. You don't need to take my word for it. Magic Spoon 100% guarantees all of their cereal. If you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money. Go to magicspoon.com slash fantasypros, grab a variety pack, use our code fantasypros to get free shipping. Again, that's magicspoon.com slash fantasypros. Use the code fantasypros for free shipping. All right, guys, let's get into the wide receiver position. And you know what? It doesn't matter either game. Elliot, what are you looking at here at the wide receiver position for cash game plays? Yeah, so I mean, anytime you look at cash game plays at the wide receiver position, you're looking for volume, bankable volume. Um, this is Stefan Diggs and Tyree Kill. This is as cheap as you can get them. Now, they have to do that because uh, otherwise you'd be able to play no one, and DraftKings doesn't want that. Uh, but Adams, Hill, Diggs, I think you have to have at least two of them. Um, they're all going to see 10-plus targets. Hill's going to avoid Tredavious White. He's going to be in the slot a lot. Um, we saw his explosive output when Mahomes was playing last week. Stefan Diggs is going to see 10-plus targets locked and loaded. Now the Chiefs have taken away the deep ball, but Stefan Diggs is a different animal. And Devontae Adams probably has the pure, toughest wide receiver cornerback matchup in Carlton Davis. But as we saw last week with Jalen Ramsey, they're going to find very unique ways to get in the football, and he's got the highest touchdown upside. So you have to pick two of the three. I would pick Tyree Kill and Stefan Diggs. Just as kind of a, a game correlation stack, and I think that uh, the, you know the price savings really pays off. And so those are two of the three guys. Two of those three guys, I think you have to have in your lineup in cash. Tags. I mean, those are you know Adams eight thousand, Tyreek Hill seventy two hundred, Stephon Diggs seven thousand on DraftKings. I I mean, are you playing two of those guys if you can afford it? Yeah, if you can afford it, that's the question. Because uh, if there's one must play on the slate, it's Travis Kelsey, right? I mean, you cannot get away from Kelsey. Uh, so fitting Kelsey in your lineup and two of those guys is probably going to be pretty difficult, but you can do it. Um, cause they've, again, they've priced down a lot of guys this week, like Devin Singletary, 4,500. You could fit him in your lineup. You could throw a, a, D- a Daryl Williams in your lineup, 4,800. You can make right. it work. So I, I definitely have no issue with this. My two that I'd be paying up for would be Devonte Adams and Diggs, just because if I'm playing Kelsey, I'm kind of getting a, a part of Mahomes. homes. Tyree kill. Fantastic. Yes. But the bills have done a good job of limiting the big play. Uh, and yes, he's, he's correct. Uh, uh Tyreek Hill has been in the slot over 50% of the time this year, so that's where Tredavious White doesn't go. But this defense as a whole, like that secondary as a whole, has played better over the second half of the year where it's like I almost don't want to tempt them. I would rather just go through the tight end, and that's where Kelsey uh, – that's why I'm going to play Kelsey. But Devontae Adams against Carlton Davis, you know, are they going to shadow him? Good luck. I mean, that's that's my advice. Jalen Ramsey last week, we saw what they were able to do, move him around the formation. Uh, get the, When you get him in motion like that, there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop the chemistry between Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams it's like legitimately indefensible I don't even care what cornerback it is and Carlton Davis to be fair is not even great I mean he's not a great cornerback he has Michael Thomas's number like that's for sure but we also found out that Michael Thomas was dealing with injuries that right. are going to require surgery this offseason uh but I um despite that despite him limiting Thomas's numbers last week he still allowed 8 of 15 passing for 164 yards and a touchdown during their two playoff games that's good for a 131.9 uh, quarterback rating so I mean I I'm, I'm not worried about Devonta Adams at all. You play him because you can't run the ball against the Bucks. It's all going to be through the air. Uh, Diggs, definitely love him. He, the guy is just ridiculous. He's caught at least six balls and 92 yards in nine of his last 11 games. That's the definition of cash game viable. I think that he's probably a better cash game play than he is tournament. So if you're going to the tournament, I, I'd, I'd go to tw- more towards Tyreek Hill. Uh, but in cash games, I think Diggs is probably the safest one of those. And so, Tags, you don't worry at all about, you know, the Chiefs and the way they limit wide receivers. I mean, Diggs, when they played the first time, he scored the touchdown, but he was yep. limited to, I think, 46. Yeah, six, six catches for 46 yards. And it was yep. a game, for what it's worth, it was a game where Josh Allen did not throw a whole lot of passes. It mm-hmm. seems like as the year's gone on, the Bills have just kind of turned into the Chiefs in a way, where they said, 
you know what, we're not even going to try and run the ball because we know it's not our bread and butter. We're just going to throw the ball around. And that's yeah. what Josh Allen's been doing, and that's what's been leading to these massive numbers for Diggs. Uh, and you're getting him at a discount, too. Like, he's the cheapest of the three at 7K. So uh, I do like Diggs. Because when I first went into this, it was more like, all right, which one do I want to do? And then the more I, I look through Diggs, the more I'm kind of like, he's just too safe to pass up. I mean, he is the avenue for them to move the ball, especially when you consider that that Moss is out and Cole Beasley's playing through an injury. John Brown really hasn't done much. So right. uh, I do like Diggs quite a bit, but I mean, guys, I want to talk about Mike Evans. Shouldn't we take a, a discount on Mike Evans and play him at 5,800? Because he, last week he played, it was uh, 82% of his snaps at left wide receiver or in the slot, which means he would avoid Jer Alexander for 82% of the game because Alexander has not moved. Uh, you, you'd, I think it's over their last 10 games uh, where Jer Alexander has played left cornerback, which means... He's basically going to see Antonio Brown uh, for most of the game. So do you guys not like Mike Evans at 5,800? Yeah, I want to ask, actually, that was what I was going to get to next, because the next three, you know, you, we talked about Adams, Hill, and Diggs. They're the three highest-priced wide receivers, as Elliot mentioned. The next three on DraftKings highest-priced wide receivers are Mike Evans at 5,800, Chris Godwin at 5,400, and Antonio Brown at 4,700. And again, Antonio Brown's, I, I don't know, his status certainly seems to be in question right now, given that he left the game and he hasn't practiced yet. So yeah, you mentioned it, Tag, you're right. Alexander doesn't shadow. He stays on his side of the field and that's basically it. So Elliot, I'll ask about Evans, but also Godwin. And I mean, we might as well throw it up there given that he's 4,700 and he's on the slate Brown if he plays. How do you feel about all those guys from a cash game perspective? Yeah, so first I, I agree with Tags that Kelsey is the first person you put in your lineup. Um, if you're gonna make 150 lineups, I'm cool if you make 150 Travis Kelsey lineups. Like, <laughs> it's absurd. Uh, his upside and floor and, you know, locked and loaded at 10 plus targets in the tight end position. That doesn't happen. So um, I mentioned the two cheaper receivers. If you do that and you kind of go the Singletary and Ronald Jones route, it allows you to play an Evans or Godwin along with them. So I, I agree with tags that you want the guy that's going to avoid Jair Alexander and Evans is going to do that. So is Godwin. Evans has more touchdown equity in this offense. Uh, he's been playing through this injury and the longer it goes on, the healthier he should get. I like him a lot. Um, I have zero interest in Antonio Brown, uh, healthy or unhealthy. We mentioned the fact that he's going to have the toughest matchup, but also this team is playing more and more 12 personnel. Against Washington, um, Cameron Bright outsnapped him because they basically used Gronk and, and pass blocking sets a lot to completely make sure that Brady is fine, right? Because a protected Brady is a winning Brady. A Brady under pressure is going to do disastrous. And he's gotten a lot of chemistry with Cam Bright, who continues to be too low owned in DFS. So you can play two tight ends this week that allows you to get up to these guys. But Evans and Godwin, very, very interested. I prefer Evans to Godwin, uh, but no interest in Antonio Brown this week. All right, so Tags, let me ask you about anybody else who's out there. I mean, Lazard has played better mm -hmm. lately, you know, as he's got further away from his injury. I don't know whether or not if Antonio Brown is out, whether or not you have any interest in Tyler Johnson, given his price, or Scotty Miller, or anything like that. So anybody else, Tags, who you're kind of looking at? I know it's cash game, so we're, we're yep. looking for safety here. There just aren't right. that many options. Mm -hmm. Anybody else who you're looking at here from a cash game perspective? Lazard would be the one for me, for sure. Uh, 4,200, uh, he saw was at eight targets last week uh, in a tough matchup against the Rams. But Aaron Rodgers is a type of quarterback where he – he really doesn't attack matchups. I remember going back to when I started, when I first started studying like wide receiver cornerback matchups and like what tendencies were and whatnot. Richard Sherman only played left cornerback for the Seahawks back in the day. Like this is going back, you know, I don't know, five, six years. And uh, I remember watching the Packers in that night and Devontae Adams, while he usually lined up on the right side of the formation, they basically just stuck, uh, I, don't, I don't remember who it was, maybe a Geronimo Allison or something like that. They just stuck him over on the right side of the field and basically said, you're just going to do nothing all game and Richard Sherman's going to stand there and be useless for their defense. And it was just like one of the smartest things ever to avoid that guy in coverage, right? And, you know, while he has Devontae Adams and while Adams is going to be a stud, whatever, um, he still has to find the other matchups, right? So he is he's a quarterback to exploit that weak secondary. And the, the weakest link in that secondary is Sean Murphy bunting. And granted, he had probably the best game of his career last week against the Saints, which 
well, Drew Brees just didn't look very good in that game. Let's just be honest about it. Uh, but that's a matchup that if you were to look over Sean Murphy Bunting's career, uh, you'd see that, I mean, the guy allows a 77% catch rate, uh, nine yards per target in his, catch, uh, his coverage. He's allowed a touchdown every 13.6 targets in his coverage this year. So knowing Lazard is coming off one of the better games that he's had this year. And again, this all comes back to the idea that the, the Bucks stop the run. You are not going to run the ball on them. Aaron Jones is going to run into a brick wall quite a bit. And the, they're, you know, basically, and then the Packers get down in the red zone and they don't really run the ball anyway. So uh, I do like Lazard at 4,200 if you're looking for a cheap option. What about you, Elliot? If you're going even further down, is it Lazard, the guy who you might be looking at or anybody else? Well, I mean, you definitely want to understand the status of Sammy Watkins, right? Because that opens up McCall Hardman or uh, Demarcus Robinson mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, Gabriel Davis is currently uh, listed as questionable if he misses. Um, that opens up more for John Brown and Cole Beasley, who currently doesn't have an injury designation, so I want to pay attention right. to that because, again, Chiefs take away the deep ball. They force it underneath. We saw Jarvis Landry catch seven passes. That can be a really nice floor. Cole Beasley at 4,100 in a PPR format, if he's a full go, I think is a phenomenal value. So um, I honestly think you could you could look at tight end as your flex as well this week. Uh, it's not something I'd love to do, but if you play Cam Braid at 3K, uh, you can get Hill – Diggs, Evans, or Adams, Diggs, Evans, and play two punt running backs and end up with like a Josh Allen or Tom Brady at quarterback. So um, I, I think Cole Beasley, if he's healthy, is the perfect cash game option. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, I was going to throw that in at the end, too, that Beasley is off the injury report now. So hopefully if he's 100% healthy, um, you know, even against that defense, he should be able to find plenty of targets and catches. And your point also about tight ends and the flex, yeah, I think that's a really good idea, actually. And again, we're, we're all sort of of the same mindset, which is you're playing Travis Kelsey. Like, that that's where you start your lineups. But the fact is that you might be able to fit in one of these other tight ends and just play them in your flex as kind of a way to pivot off if we don't love any of the wide receivers and get them at a cheaper price. All right, let's go to quarterback here, guys. And obviously, we have four options. I mean, we can assume Patrick Mahomes is playing at the moment. Mahomes, 7,600. Josh Allen, 6,900. Aaron Rodgers, 6,500. And Tom Brady, 6,100. So what are you thinking, Elliot, for cash games? I think it's Josh Allen. And it's not just because he's got a nice price. It's it's the fact that he's got such a high floor <laughs> and ceiling combination, right? I think it's seven games this year with 30 or more DraftKings points. He's become the top rusher on the team as well. He's going to get the goal line carries. And last week was his absolute floor in a run-oriented opposing team that we're not going to see the Chiefs do that. So if Mahomes plays, that game's just going to open up. And his rushing upside is the highest because Mahomes is going to have the toe injury, which could limit him. Playoff Mahomes is normally the guy I want because last year he was averaging eight carries a game. That rushing upside on top of his passing upside is phenomenal. But I'm always looking for quarterbacks with... um, the ability to use their legs because it just adds such a higher floor and ceiling, especially in caps cash games. So I think Josh Allen is your cash game quarterback this week. Yeah, I agree with that. Also on Fandle is 8,500 third highest priced quarterback uh, tags. We talked about Mahomes last week and how in the playoffs he does kind of add that rushing, but you know, assuming that he does play and he clears a concussion protocol, like that toe, if it's turf toe, whatever it is, like it was clearly limiting him la- last week. Mm-hmm. I think we can assume it's going to limit him this week, which is going to cap the rushing floor. So are you with us as well? Are you going with Josh Allen in cash games? It's either Josh Allen or Aaron Rodgers, depending on what you do. Uh, you know, Elliot was talking about, you know, one of those getting two of those top three wide receivers. And if you come down because we want to play Kelsey and so you get Kelsey and you get two of those receivers. If you play Devonte Adams and Diggs, I don't know if you can get to Josh Allen. It, it, it's literally that it's that that four hundred dollars can make that difference in your lineup because I was playing around with it. It's really difficult to do. However, if you go with Tyreek Hill and Stephon Diggs and Travis Kelsey, you can fit Josh Allen in there. So I actually like both these quarterbacks. I think they're both fine. Uh, Rogers at home has been money. Uh, it's it's almost to the point with these quarterbacks where it's going to come down to the weather. And I've been trying to pay attention to that as the week goes on. They're expecting some rain in KC, whereas in Green Bay it's supposed to be a little bit colder. Uh, but Rogers at home has just been so damn good uh, over the course of his entire career. But this year too um the concern that you have is obviously tampa bay was the only team this year to hold him to fewer than 18 fantasy points in a game but again that was a long time ago that game was in tampa things have changed a bit uh josh allen presents a higher floor so if all things were if you had the choice of anybody you know out there who's your number one quarterback this week that you can play price is not an option 
it might it's probably Josh Allen at 6900 but I don't think if you need the $400 if you can't get to Allen I don't think Rodgers is a bad fallback Okay, so we then have talked about three of the four quarterbacks on the slate. The one we didn't talk about at all is Tom Brady at 6,100. I'll throw it to you first. Elliot, are you just no consideration whatsoever in cash games. You'll find a way to pay up a little bit more for any of the other quarterbacks, I right? think Tom Brady's really interesting in GPPs, right? And we talked yep. uh, a little bit before, but, like, your GPP strategy on a two-game slate this week is so contest-dependent, right? Like, if you want to play... Mm-hmm a GPP where there's 200 people, you probably don't need to go to Tom Brady. But if you want to play in the one where you're trying to make a million dollars, right? You know, Tom Brady might be 15% owned. That's typically a high owned player, but not on a two game slate. So at that point, you could potentially stack them up with Chris Godwin and Mike Evans and have a very unique roster construction. I really think that's the way you attack Tom Brady this week. Tags, you agree with that? Yeah, no, I like it. And that I, I, Elliot hit on a big point is that if you're playing DFS, you have to understand the contest that you're in, uh, the the amount of contestants that are in the contest. And that's like a big thing. It takes a long time to hit on that and describe the differences that should be in your lineup. But yeah, I I agree with Elliot. All right, let's get to tight end where we know what the answer is in this case, which we we all agree with. It is Kelsey. But yeah, Kelsey is 8,000. The second highest priced tight end is Robert Tunyon at 3,600. So why don't we talk about, you know, the couple of other guys. We've got Tunyon at 3,600, Gronkowski at 3,200. Great at 3,000 and Dawson Knox at 2,800. So, Elliot, you mentioned the, the great point, which is it might be something where you think about playing one of these guys in your flex. So, if so, who might you be looking to do that with? Yeah, because Travis Kelsey is a receiver, right? I mean, he's a receiver that's playing yep. tight end. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's just, he's got a 20 point floor and a 35 point ceiling. That's, it's absurd. <laughs> yep. um, and it's why he's AK. Bob Tunyon is too cheap. Um, 3600 that's a value like you start comparing him to those wide receivers and he's definitely in play there he's got a touchdown upside in that offense so i don't mind him at all gronk is basically touchdown or bust at this point because he's blocking so much cam Brate will come in with such low ownership and he's taken over um you know a bigger role in that passing game and a bigger role down the middle as well it's not just like he's getting four targets with an eight out of four yards right i mean he's got um 80 and 60 yards the last two weeks so or 80 and 50 yards the last two weeks, excuse me. Uh, and then Dawson Knox is a pure, I'm hoping he gets in the end zone play. Um, yeah. You know, you can attack the Chiefs with tight ends, but he doesn't really offer, he's not going to get a ton of volume in that offense. So uh, I definitely think two tight ends is a viable strategy. Uh, Robert Tunyon is, is the guy that has the highest floor. I think Cam Braid is a really intriguing GPP play because he's going to come in at sub 10% ownership. All right, Tags, how about you break it down other than Travis Kelsey, who should be locked into your cash game lineups? I don't think any of them are locks, but uh, if you're looking for a cheap one, Dawson Knox, you look at game script, you look at, uh, again, the lack of running game, you you think, like, what's KC going to do to eliminate Diggs or at least slow him down, and you look underneath, and you go to Dawson Knox at 2,800. I think he's fine to play there if you want to put him in the flex just as a guy that you're hoping scores a touchdown. You know, maybe sees three, four targets, whatever, something like that. But at 2,800, it allows you to do some crazy things in your lineups, like get Devontae Adams, like get Stephon Diggs, Travis Kelsey, and all those guys. So, um, I don't – Tunyon, it's just – I would love to get to Tunyon in 36. He is underpriced. However, if you do that, you, you – you, you can't fit someone else in there. Like, you have to eliminate one of the players that we've been talking about, and I don't know if the upgrade of getting to Tunyon is worth it. So I, I'd probably just go at Knox if you're looking for the cheap, cheap option. Yeah, I kind of – Elliot had kind of mentioned it earlier with Beasley and in, in sort of you know, the way the Chiefs funnel a little bit towards the middle of the field, where if Beasley were limited, I would like Doc, uh, Knox a little bit more, yeah. you know, for, for what we might be able to get out of him. But if Beasley is off the injury report, which he is, and he's 100% healthy – that's really going to limit Knox, who, who's basically running a route on, you know, three quarters of the of the pass play. So he was somebody who was intriguing, but if Beasley is 100 percent, a little less so. All right. Let's touch briefly on DSTs, uh, you know, before we just talk about our favorite tournament plays. The Packers are at thirty six hundred. This is on DraftKings. The Chiefs at thirty one hundred. The Bills at twenty eight hundred and the Bucks at twenty seven hundred. So, Elliot, what do you think you're going to be doing with the defenses? Um, praying. <laughs> right i mean, you're, you're, I mean we talked to in the open about how good these quarterbacks are i mean tom brady's probably the most likely to turn the ball over uh, the bucks defense might be the defense with the most pure talent they get a lot of guys back the packers are missing david bakhtiari 
that sounds fantastic, but then you realize that it's Aaron Rodgers and he doesn't turn the ball over and you're kind of mm-hmm. hoping for some fluke plays. So um, yeah. taking on Patrick Mahomes isn't exciting. Uh, taking on Josh Allen mm-hmm. or Tom Brady isn't exciting. I think if I had to pick one, it would be the Chiefs because Allen has taken mm-hmm. some bad sacks before and he is known as a, as a risk taker and they are the home team uh, that take away the deep ball and that's what the Bills really like to do. So if they're able to do that, Allen might force it. So I think the Bills at 3100 are, are the oh, sorry the Chiefs at 3100 are the pure best play, but that four hundred dollars in savings going, dropping down on the bucks it really might be the difference between two points and four points, and that four hundred dollars could really open you up someplace else. So for me it would be the Chiefs, but honestly whatever fits to make the rest of your lineup work works for me. Tags. Yep, the Chiefs are the best play in terms of like if you if I had, if I had all the money and if it was just like what, which one are you gonna play it would be the Chiefs defense. But I went down to the Bills, so the the hundred dollars between the Bills and the Bucks, uh, it was it was enough to to make things work. Like literally, I came, I came out of it with zero dollars left in the cash lineup. Uh, so I went with the Bills because I I do believe that Mahomes maybe if he's a little bit limited, Mahomes he's a gunslinger. He does not care sometimes. And the Bills defense again, they have been playing better. You just hope they get some pressure. Maybe that he's a little gimpy. I would just rather take. The chance on that than I would against Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay because the guy just doesn't turn the ball over. Yeah, no, I mean on on Fanduel especially it's a little uh, different. The Bills are thirty four hundred, the Bucks thirty seven hundred, the Chiefs forty one hundred, and the Packers forty four hundred. I am playing the Bills there uh, at thirty four hundred. Again, you mentioned it, Tags. Mahomes is a little gimpy. None of these are is a good option. Like there just isn't for all the reasons that we've talked about. So for me, I am taking the discount as much as possible, which is the general Tags strategy. Okay. Let's get to tournament plays here. And Elliot, I think I'll just probably, it's such a short, I don't think we need to go position by position. And you've, you've referenced it a little bit when we sort of talked about a couple of players, Brady in particular, but why don't you just start talking about some of your top tournament plays that you're looking at this weekend? Well, I mean, it's basically pivots off the cash plays, right? Mm-hmm. So like, if you're not going to play Hill, you probably want to get someone else in the Kansas City offense, assuming that Kelsey doesn't take all of the, all of it. Um, so Hardman or Robinson or Watkins, if he's, if he's fully healthy. Um, you know, potentially looking at John Brown, um, looking at two tight end builds. I think it's really more about your roster construction. You know, if I'm going to pay up for Mahomes, go with Mahomes, Hill, and Kelsey, um, and run it back with Diggs, that's going to be tough to afford, but your team is going to be very different. You basically start trying to bet on the, the top guys busting. Maybe it's the, the, the Bucks are able to take away Devonta Adams, so I'm going to go in on um, Tunyon and Alan Lazard. Right, maybe this. All right, you know what I mean. Like, I think that's Good. the general strategy for GVP this week. How about you, Tax? Yeah, I. I- I think McCole Hardman was a good one, uh, even if Watkins plays, because Hardman is his sometimes just pops off. He has those games. Uh, but the one that I keep going back to is Marquez Valdez Scanling. He's not a very good football player. I think everybody knows that by now. But he does have those games that are just kind of like off the charts. And you know, if, if for whatever reason the Bucks figure out a way to scheme and slow down Devonte Adams like they did Michael Thomas, which I don't think is going to happen. But if it does, that's again you're pivoting off that Devonte Adams chalk away from Alan Lazard, who's cheaper. Um, or actually, you know. Lazard is, was it like a $200 difference between those two? Whatever the case is. But uh, the, people, including myself, would rather play Lazard in cash. But Valdez Scantling is the ultimate tournament play because it just takes one pass to literally change the game. Okay. I love it. Great. Broke down two games. I'm very excited for this championship weekend. It's going to be great. Elliot, uh, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you volunteering to come on the walks with me and my son <laughs> and teach him more about various penalties. Please, again, make sure that all the uh, the drinks are virgin because that's how Will Roll's not ready yet for the hard stuff. But uh, mind everybody, you do great work. Just mind everybody where they can find it. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Elliot Christ, 1L1T and no H in Chris. And all my work can be found on FTNDaily.com and FTNBets.com. Uh, full breakdowns of all the DFS stuff we just talked about at ftndaily.com. All right, we will be back next week doing more podcasting. I'll talk to you. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our featured videos as well. Also, make sure to click that red subscribe button to get notified when we post videos in the future.